This is the Roaring Elephant Podcast, and uh, as professional as we are today, we're only one hour late in our normal recording slot because the gods of audio equipment have been mad at me for some reason. But never fear, Dave is here. Yeah, <laughs> the the curse of the live demo and the curse of the audio equipment fritz, uh, I think, are very closely related. But we are here. Yes, we are, and we're alone, but we're going to be talking about stuff that we don't do, we're talking about stuff from the Open SSF. and since Dave is our resident security expert, please tell the audience what the Open SSF is. <laughs> oh, setting me up for failure straight away. Well, we've actually had uh, someone from the Open SSF before, so David Wheeler came on to introduce us uh, to the Open SSF. And that was on episode, <laughs> struggling to find it, episode 264. There we go. No way we have more than 200 episodes. I'm afraid we do. I'm afraid we do. But you can think of the OpenSF. So the OpenSF is part of the Linux Foundation and it is focused on um, understanding security within the open source ecosystem. And we are today talking about a particular uh, working group or project within the OpenSSF, uh, something called Alpha Omega. And uh, do you want to explain what Alpha Omega actually means versus how it's used here? <laughs> well, the Alpha Omega is the beginning and the end, right? I think the earliest references are in the Bible as well, as far as I know. <laughs> But yeah. it's supposed to be kind of a growing from a beginning embryonic stage into the all-encompassing everything and everything ending, actually, because Omega is supposed to be the death of everything. <laughs> now, fortunately, I would say they're not using those uh, connotations in their planning because I'm hoping the OpenSSF does try to live on beyond Omega here, whatever they're going to call Indeed. that. Indeed. But the OpenSSF uh, Alpha Omega project is... Uh, I think A, very timely, uh, and B, I think it's a it's a pretty interesting sort of approach to trying to tackle um, some of the challenges we have with open source ecosystems and um, the sort of ever marching journey towards uh, improving security across that. So let's maybe start off with um, like some of the fundamentals. The the Alpha and Omega project has two kind of core pieces to it. I'm surprisingly <laughs> named Alpha <laughs> and Omega. Now, I think Alpha the idea around Alpha is to find out what are the the top one hundred, I think it was, um, open source projects in terms of quote unquote criticality. Uh, and, you know, first of all, identify them. Mm. And second of all, figure out how we can, oh, yeah, we as a, as a whole can, um, can sort of further assist them in securing their projects or in providing assistance on how to secure their projects. The Omega part of this is identifying the top 10,000 open source projects, I believe is the number, mm -hmm. and providing them a way of also kind of improving the level of security in their open source projects as well. Now, as you, you can imagine those numbers, like 100 projects, 10,000 projects. I don't see a problem. <laughs> <laughs> um you know, you're not going to just, uh, you know, sign up a bunch of security researchers and say, okay, there you go. Um, so there's there's quite a lot, uh, a lot more to this. 5,000 in the morning, 5,000 in the afternoon. Done. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah the, boat, the Alpha and Omega, it's like, it's in two ways, two parts, right? Because it, it, there is a time uh, sequence to that. It's want to start with Alpha with the 100 to more or mm. less figure out how this is supposed to work. Because... Um, there, there, there's a YouTube uh, video from the OpenSF, uh, uh, how do you call that, uh, the board of directors <laughs> online that you can watch and that had some Q&A going on there. And they kind of, this is a new thing. It's a bit of an experiment at the moment because they are still mm. trying to figure out how this is going to work. 
And that way, starting with a smaller size, and even though they said 100 is the alpha target, they also said in the Q&A, well, we'll start with five and then grow to 10 and 15 again to make this scalable because yeah, this is kind of new and for them as well, it's figuring out how to make this a scalable solution to then pass on the knowledge again with the alpha season into the omega set where they can go for the 10,000. The second split between the two is that alpha is going to be pretty much hands-on with uh, mm. actual people doing a lot of stuff which of course isn't scalable into the 10,000 range where there will be much more of a focus on automated pipelines and things like that. And the automated pipelines they will need for that Omega set will be built, tested, vetted in the alpha stage. So they do have a decent way of looking at this. I mean, a lot of times these kind of projects, they go for the pie in the sky and take too much on themselves and peter out because basically it they'll get overwhelmed. Doing it this way, I think it have a, has a, a better chance of uh, actually surviving long term. And even if only the alpha project survives and they never get to Omega for whatever reason, the experience they will have gained will at least be usable and applicable on a lot of open source projects. Yeah. I mean, the one of the important things that we possibly haven't quite touched on yet is the fact that this is a... This isn't like the... OpenSSF are going to deploy a whole bunch of security researchers into a hundred uh, open source projects. This is a combination of, yes, that sort of expertise. It's a combination of uh, automated tooling and, and pipelines. And it's really engaging with the maintainers of those projects and it could be as you know for a well let's say a well managed well maintained well staffed project it could be as simple as you know identifying and and filing sort of um, bug reports and the the project maintainers uh, you know there's plenty of them to to go around and and they just kind of knock those key things off as they're identified but it could also be that um you know, they're, they're looking to potentially even sort of contribute those fixes as well uh, back to the open source projects as part of that engagement. So, you know, yeah. finding them, finding them in a either a, a direct way initially, in a more automated way in the future, and potentially contributing fixes back. So there's like there's a variety of different. Um, yeah. Kind of that wasn't actually very clear engagement. to me. Uh, I was kind of that's one of the questions I had in my head after watching the the, the, the presentation video there. If it's going to be purely in the advisory, uh, you should do this. You should look at this. You should look at. You should use these tools. And here's a tool chain we prepared for you to do. Or will they actually be come members of those projects? Because uh, I can see good uses in both ends. But it's more of the, lo the, the long-term commitment you make. Uh, we talked about this earlier, when you have you become a committer to a project, you kind of should feel responsible to maintain the stuff you committed to that thing because you built that, you know how it works, you know the idea behind it. If you just dump it in there, that could become a problem in the long end. So on the one hand, I would uh, kind of want them to be just advisory so that the committers, mm. the, the real core project members, they have done the work and so the knowledge remains within the project. Because if you have the security experts and OpenSSF stepping in, fixing some stuff and leaving again, it gets more fragile that way, right? So, I mean, on the other hand, if they don't do it, will the project have enough resources to actually enforce the, uh, enforce is a bad word, uh, deploy the recommendations they yeah. receive. So it's, yeah. I, I think this is this is where you see the distinction between committers and contributors, because I th I believe the goal is that in in areas where projects need more assistance, that the OpenSSF will be uh, more playing more of a contributor role than 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 expecting to be an actual committer, but. The other part of of this is that this is still very very early stages. Like the, the the project is still in its infancy, which is actually you know for anyone that this is kind of piquing their interest, uh, I do think this is a really kind of excellent time uh, to get involved in this project. If this is something that you're interested in, 
Um, you know, the OpenSSF is definitely looking for thoughts, opinions, guidance, feedback on, you know, all of the things that, that we've been talking about so far. Uh, which is why we're doing the podcast episode now, right? <laughs> to try Indeed. and give it more visibility, to give it more, more notoriety. I like that word. So how did you... How did you pick up on the the automated and, and the sort of pipeline element? Like what, what sort of things stood out to you on that? Um, well, again, nothing in, set in stone yet. They're still looking around. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing that came up was the question of should it all be open source tooling in the tools and the tool chain or could there be commercial stuff in there? And um, I had a feeling they kind of hedged their bets a lot there. And I, th I think their answer was correct. For the, the main thing was look at quality. If we, we yeah. need to make this security, so if we do this stuff, it needs to be done well. And if open source has toolings for that, great, we'll definitely use that. Why the hell would we not? Obviously. But if mm -hmm. it makes sense to improve the security, to make it better, easier, whatever, to go commercial, then they would not shy away from that. So is that good or bad? I guess it's both. Uh, if it's missing an open source, I guess some open source should build something to be able to replace the commercial part. <laughs> But yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, I do think that there's an element of this which is, um, like they're still they're still trying to figure out how you know what components they need in this in this kind of automation chain, and I, I, I think that the first the work they do in alpha will probably inspire. Um, the automation okay. work that they will end up doing in latter stages of alpha and the earlier stages of, of omega, assuming they get to that. The the piece, I mean, one of the things that I'm kind of interested in is this could, I wouldn't necessarily say obsolete, but this could be very interesting for those organizations that basically make their, their livelihoods out of a variety of code scanning um, software tools. I mean, as 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 being on the vendor mm -hmm. side, the number of times I've I've had kind of vulnerability reports, should we say, uh, shared by um, you know someone on the customer side has their security team has run their in-house tooling purchased from a another vendor, and it's come back with a whole load of vulnerabilities that are just you know basically garbage and, and are not. Uh, are not relevant in in certain ways, and I, I know you've certainly had a a previous history there as well. This this feels like something that you know quite a bit further down the line could be adopted by other organisations just to use for their own projects, assuming the the whole kind of tool chain and everything else ends up being open source. Let's assume let's assume it's going to be successful, or otherwise we shouldn't be talking about this. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's going to be open source. They've already committed that everything they build will be committed back to the open source, of course, unless they're adding commercial tools into it, but the whole pipelining will be committed. Yeah, everybody will be able to use that. Now, will that totally avoid commercial things? I don't know. I mean, MariaDB hasn't replaced Oracle. No. Um, now, those are maybe two way different things but there are other things where there's both an open source and a commercial part of it and if you're looking at things like security scanning there's on the one hand uh, the um, i'm a good guy i want to have say uh, secure software so that's why i do the thing and you have the commercial interest of uh, i need a check in the box so that if something happens i'm i get identification i get protection i can prove i did what it is so i need an official whatever so let's go for a commercial solution because then I can just say it's not my problem, it's their problem now. Open source typically will give you the tooling, you will need the intelligence to use the tooling correctly, but the bug stops with you. With commercial, that could be an extra thing that they could offer. Now, what is of course possible and has happened with open source solutions before is that commercial entities adopt the open source uh, resources, put some serviceability whatever around it and yep. then put a market proposition of that and i think that if this does indeed succeed then that is something that will happen and is that a problem for the commercial entities well they'll have to prove that they have a differentiating value and mm. that's good competition is good 
Yeah, yeah. No, I, I think this is pretty exciting. I mean, the, one of the questions that I think you called out was just like how how scalable is this? And they, I know, early on they in the in the uh, the, the webinar they mentioned things around. Um, how they aim to do this on a cadence, but that cadence is like is up for discussion, whether it's on a per project basis. Um, like it, this isn't something that they would do, you know, daily or once a month or even once every six months or maybe once a year. Like it, it's going to depend on both. I think the level of criticality of the product, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, project how um how rapidly it's changing you know if you've got a very critical project but there's hardly any change in it you probably don't need to be um auditing it quite so aggressively uh, yeah but if you don't audit it you don't know how big the changes were yeah i think a single that line the, of code the, can be very <laughs> yeah yeah true but i think that there needs to be like you just need to have an understand you need to put a line in the sand as to you know, what your what your yeah. dimensions are going to be but also i think their the mission statement they don't have one yet although they have a, a phrase but that, that's not what i meant but the way they want to do this i think is not that they become responsible for the security of the project it's more that they no. give the tooling and a little, a little bit of enablement some teaching if you like to the projects mm -hmm. how to do this uh, giving a tool set is a very important part because now a lot of projects have three maintainers and sorry we don't have enough resources to do that as well mm -hmm. so if this is something you can just download or maybe available as a service you send your code to it and it brings back a report of things that will make it a lot easier for those, for those projects and as long as you open the set and has some decent documentation or how to's or on the hands-on help with a security expert to teach people how to use this stuff then it can become a i'm going to say minor investment of resources but a much less heavy investment of resources for smaller projects and bigger projects alike to keep doing this on a continuous basis because for me the moment they talk about a tool chain <clears throat> for me that means it becomes part of your build chain mm. so you do your compilation or before you do compilation you do first your checking of your code and then after compilation check which libraries are in there before you build the thing and if you then i don't know build a docker container to be a, consum a consumable thing you scan a docker container for that is how i would see this working and at that point it becomes almost zero effort except when OpenSF updates their tool chain and that's actually where I was wondering a bit about the scalability of this thing, because security things uh, evolve quite often. I mean, there's new mm. things popping up all the time. Uh, things break, things get fixed, things break again. So the tool chain is either going to be very generic, which means less precise reports, or very specific and needs to be updated continuously as well. And that part will always remain with the OpenSSF. That's, of course, why it's good that this is an open SSF uh, uh, mm. Linux Foundation project because they have some longevity built in because they're a foundation, so they should be able to do that. But that's going to be on them totally. Yeah. In fact, the, the more the more you talk about that, the more I think that part of the part of the journey that the Alpha Omega project will have to go through is that of adoption. Like they will have just like any other open source project they will have to convince. you know gain a yeah well c convince people to use it is one yeah. part but actually successfully build a community around it is the other part yeah. like there's there's uh like right now there are 293 people in the working group to for securing critical projects uh on slack and there are 110 people on Slack in the Alpha Omega channel on the OpenSSF Slack. So on the one hand, that sounds like quite a lot of people. Uh, in terms of, you know, 10,000 projects and 100 projects, it's not very many people at all. So like there are, there's probably enough people here to start you know, a very early proposal. Yeah, but hang on, how many, how many of those hundreds are looking at what can you do for me? And how many of those yeah. hundreds are what can I do for you? Well, I would imagine <laughs> that uh, almost all of them are what can you do for me? Uh, you know, like, like 
by myself, like I'm not an uh, active, um, you know, member of the, uh, open SSF alpha omega project. I'm actually considering getting involved and engaged because I think that I might be able to help, but I'm mostly connected just so I can keep up to date as to how the project is continuing. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of the people will be, you know, in that bucket rather than the actively creating things. So that's why I think that this is more of a, an adoption and a community building sort of exercise that it'll have to go through in order to be really successful. Yeah. And they got a bit of an uphill battle there. That's, um, I, I fear because in the webinar, most of the questions had in the Q and A were about how do I get into the 100 projects, how I can get my project in those early, uh, early mm. adoption things to, to get the vetting and happen. But I mean, it's open source, so let's hope it works as open source, open source works. It does look like they have a value on offer here that a lot of people would appreciate. And they also kind of, they, they never said, okay, this is going to be our selection criteria. They stayed very vague on that. But the one thing they did say is that um, you can't ask for your project to be, to be included, but if you become part of the conversation and part of the project, if you get to know you, then obviously if you have to make selections, <laughs> which makes total sense. I mean, uh, this is not even a meritocracy. It's just normal common sense. If you're an engaged product, you should get some advantage there. So a bit of luck that will help the community grow a little bit faster. The community on the, I, what can I do for you part? Mm. Uh, so that should help them a lot, I think. But uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, the, the, we, well, I mean, we talked with David Wheeler back in, um, it was that September 2021 and you know this this project is still kind of still very new as we've said a number of times but they you know they have released for example a an initial um list of how they're uh, creating what they call the criticality score um and it, it looks at a variety of different things like the uh, you know, number of GitHub stars, you know, when it was, you know, how long it's been created for, uh, how long it was since it was last updated, how many contributors there are. How does that um, translate to criticality? Well, you know, commit frequency, recent updates, closed issues, updated issues, dependencies is another one. Or, yeah. Uh, yeah, dependents count and commit frequency so they're using those kinds of things to come up with does that make sense um, a criticality score now whether you think that that makes sense or not <laughs> okay don't disregard you on fine no well <laughs> i mean it 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 does seem to be it does seem to work in some way, shape or form because, and the reason I say that is the top, I mean, just like the top 10 projects uh, in terms of criticality. And again, this is just according to uh, a set of um, rules that they, they've kind of been testing out. Mm -hmm. None of this is set in stone. Yep. But the top 10 are Node, Kubernetes, Rust, Spark, uh, Nix packages, CMSSW, TensorFlow, Symfony, definitely typed, and Git. And I don't know about all of those, but again, I'm world's worst developer here. But the ones that I do recognize definitely feel like pretty critical projects. Yeah, there are a couple in there. That, I mean, this sounds more like a popularity contest. And I mean, critical for me, if you look at critical infrastructure, you're not using the infrastructure that's been used a lot. It's the infrastructure that if it breaks has very big repercussions. Mm. Now Kubernetes, yeah, I can make, make sense. If it's an underpinning of a lot of things, if that breaks, a lot of stuff is going to break. But uh, can you stand, say the first, uh, the, the third or the fourth one in the line? It was around Kubernetes, you said one. Uh, so there was Node, Kubernetes, Rust, Spark, Spark, for instance. packages. What's yeah. the problem if Spark breaks? My advertisement no, no longer be personalized. Oh my God. Well, <laughs> it's not about breaking though, is it? It's, it's about, about insecure. security yes. vulnerability. 
but Spark right. is used to train your models. The model itself is not Spark. So whatever is running in production is a thing that was created through Spark, mm. but should not be in the vulnerability anymore. Uh, TensorFlow, kind of same-ish, although that's still part of the neural network. So yeah, I guess that makes a little bit more sense. But I mean, again, Kubernetes, that make, it makes sense because it's a foundational thing. And if that breaks, the whole thing built on top breaks as well. Uh, but KVM, for example, why Kubernetes, but not KVM? Very good question. Let's see where KVM is on this. And I think that for the moment, KVM is not as alive as Kubernetes anymore. Well, so, I mean, the, the interesting thing is that uh, just, and again, we're just looking at this from a very, very high level, yeah. but like Linux, for example, is down at number 21. Okay, that's um, the kernel, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, what else? Yeah, that, that, should be the, that should be number one with a star. Um, what? else is kind of open ssl is is down at number 26 Jeez. um it also said that if they had to make the list last year log 4 j would not be part of it <laughs> yeah and <laughs> was when they were talking about how the rule set should work and it should adapt <laughs> and yeah so log 4 j is actually down at number uh, 2544 so I, your your point around the around a um around it being a bit of a popularity contest, I think is is actually valid. But one of the things that they mentioned on the webinar, and I think is is coming out in this conversation here, is that this is like one method using data that you know you can weight in a variety of different ways, but it's just trying to get some idea from using data. Mm -hmm. And I think what what we're talking about is that the data isn't always exactly aligned with how we think about the criticality of these uh, these projects. And I think that's probably the difference here. How do you how do you mean that? Well, you know, you you brought up um, you know the fact that Linux is down at number twenty seven. Like now, is is it is it you know, if it's un, if it underpins almost almost mm -hmm. every other technology on this list, surely that should mean it's number one. I mean, it underpins your mobile phones. Can you imagine mobile phones? It's the most critical thing in the world these days. I'm not talking about yeah. Facebook and stuff like that, but everything is happening through mobile phones these days. Yeah, and the the problem, the, the weird thing is that if even if you look at the number of stars or commits on GitHub. Linux kernel must be up there at the top somewhere, right? It's one of the most worked upon projects available, I would imagine. I haven't, haven't really looked at it, to be honest, because I don't consider myself good enough in any shape or form to be committing to the, current, to the Linux kernel. But I can't imagine that even in a popularity contest that it would be below uh, Rust, for oh. example. Let's see if I can figure out why that is. Mm. I think it could be... I mean, on the other hand, it being a popularity contest, definitely the alpha stage is not a bad thing because it means it's a very active uh, project, which means that a lot will be done on a short amount of time and they'll mm -hmm. learn stuff. I mean, it would, if they take a project that's very critical, but there's like two people work on it uh, twice on a Sunday and <laughs> never again, there's not a lot they can learn from that. So I'm assuming oh, that the list will also change between alpha and omega, how they create oh, yeah. the list. Yeah, definitely. But I think one of the things that has has bumped it possibly down on the criticality score is the commit frequency. Right. So because it is actually, and this is this is just a complete guess based on glancing at the data uh, and comparing it with things that are further up, but it has such a high commit frequency now you could you could argue that that should mean that uh, it's potentially more at risk mm -hmm. but my guess would be and all i have is a um uh a csv dump so i'm not kind of uh, there are no formulas or anything in this but my guess would be that the if a project is very active 
then they're less concerned about um, you know something going in there and then not being seen. Um, but again, this is just a, a guess based on mm. a quick thirty second glimpse at the data. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things I should look at is the complexity of the project because one of the questions I had in the webinar was, uh, what's the granularity going to be for OpenSSF Alpha and Omega? Uh, is it going to be a Linux distribution, for example, or just a package? And they kind of said they're looking at the package level. Yeah. So a Linux kernel, that's uh, a big package. That's a big yeah. chunk of change. You're going to spend a lot of time on that. So especially for your alpha, where you want to kind of have projects start to finish multiple ones, not in two days, but like a couple of weeks, a couple of months to have iteration availability. If you pick up something like Linux kernel, you're going to be spending two years on that before you've done your, your first uh, run through, I guess. It's kind of surprising that that's not, is that how they're looking with the number of commits that too many commits becomes, ooh, let's not grab that one just yet because it's just going to be too much to, to, to handle at the moment. I don't, I don't think it's the too much to handle. I, again, we're just yeah. guessing here at this point, but my, my, my gut feel would be that if you've got a lot of commits happening in a project, it's getting a lot of love and attention. And therefore there is, Maybe they 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 just perceive that there are less chance that there will be um, howling kind of vulnerabilities. Like we know there are still vulnerabilities. The more it changes, the kernel. more risk you have. Maybe, but then the more the more attention a project has like that, yeah. the more. But then they're the already attention has the more eyes are on the project. Yeah, but then they're going to start already vetting projects of perceived security. Yeah, which is but, probably this is the what this is trying to fix, yeah. right? That everyone perceived open source to be secure by default because of so many people looking at it, whatever. The last couple of months, last couple last year or so, things have crept up that oh, we should really make this uh, a serious effort. That's why this comes from. So if then start off with uh, this, uh, this, the, the, the selecting of projects because well, I mean Linux kernel, they have to be secure, right? not the right i don't know again it's which, all which is why like it's still there like it's still in the top 100 <laughs> okay but, fair enough <laughs> I, yeah i mean it, it, i i do agree that um and this this again this i believe will change a lot over the next um you know who knows how long as the alpha omega project kind of figures out how best to do this but i do think there's an element that needs to be factored in that isn't part of the the data that I currently mm -hmm. see in in their kind of calculations, and I don't know where you get that that data from. Like, how would you how would you you know what data would you use to inform that kind of importance from your perspective? Uh, if I were them, I would form the opinion on people willing to help with that project. If I would kind of, I would go, with, I'm not sure if it's the right way to do it, but personally, because you need a community, you need people to help with this, especially in the alpha stage. Just put a call out there, okay, projects, if you want to be part of the first 100, tell us how much effort you're willing to put into this. Because that's what mm. I think the project needs to get that iteration, that that's critical mass to start rolling forwards. Is it, is it the, is it the ideal? No, no, there's some negatives on that as well, but yeah, I'm kind of surprised that that isn't their, their first choice, their first data point. I think the problem with that approach is that you'd get, it just doesn't, it doesn't deal with the primary challenge, which is the project is trying to focus on the most critical projects. And just because someone says, Hey, yeah, I'd love some help. That doesn't mean they're a critical project. And it just, yeah. And I'm actually. I, I understand why you're saying that, but I don't think that that answers the the problem. Uh, my thing is actually, I think that there's, and again, I, I'm just me, right? I'm not saying they're doing it wrong. They know more <laughs> about this than I do. It's just you're asking my opinion, giving my opinion yeah, yeah. that the way they go to the alpha stage, they they they're gonna get in trouble because they want the most critical ones first, while they're still learning how to do this. Mm. Now, personally, if I go to the hospital and I need open heart surgery. I don't want a student that's figuring out how to do this. I want the guy that has done this a hundred times. And here, I mean, they're putting their total novice, novicity, is that a word? It is now into the most critical uh, projects out there. So that, that, for me, that doesn't really, 
it's not a good marriage. Um, again, it all depends on how they actually do this and how this gets rolled out and blah and whatever. And even though there is a time factor that Alpha will come before Omega, it, they never said Alpha will stop when Omega starts. So no. in that case, you could still say in the 100 most uh, critical for the Alpha, let's take the, the low-hanging fruits first and don't take the most complex ones. So again, a lot of questions at the moment. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think some of it is also, again, looking at uh, there's a, a few other things that have stood out in the data that I think are kind of weird. So like the like Ceph as a project is number 19 and Linux as a project is number 21. Now, if you look at the, like, there's clearly something strange going on there. But if you look at it, the dependence count for uh, for the Ceph project, you know, are 36, no, 363,000 dependents. Whereas the Linux kernel project only has um, 21,000. Now that's clearly like the, that's not quite right because actually the, the Linux kernel, as you say, so yeah, but that's not dependence, right? Dependence means yeah. you require it for your build. I know, so I know. Apparently, but Ceph gets included in a lot of stuff, while Linux just runs a lot of stuff. Exactly. Just. Like it's a different kind of depends. Like, as you, exactly as you said, you know, your 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 Android mobile phone without, well, I suppose depending on how you view uh, Android and Linux, um, you know, your your mobile phone without that would be uh, mm -hmm. a brick. Um, but it was also a question that came up. Servers uh, or cloud services would also be. Uh, dumb bricks without it but they're not dependencies from a build perspective they're just dependencies from a if it didn't have a linux kernel it wouldn't run perspective i guess that was one of the questions came up in the webinar as well that if you select a project and you secure that project will you also secure all the dependencies of that project because if you use a, a thing and that thing uses tar and tar has a vulnerability in it can you still say that the thing you're checking is secure if it contains that tar with a bug mm. And the answer was basically, yes, we will, because we will give you a stamp of approval on project and not on their dependencies. Now, mm. they are, they did always say that the selection of the 100 would probably be an ecosystem, things that are mm. somewhat related to each other. Uh, I mean, going back to my past, Hadoop, for example, be a good example there. If you're going to do Spark, well, also do Hive and do ACFS because Mm. maybe a lot of the same people involved anyway so it's a single build tree perhaps so it might make sense there no i don't think i'll do hadoop anymore because hadoop has kind of gone out of favor these days i still miss mm -hmm. the elephant but we keep it alive <laughs> and roaring um but yeah but they, yeah, they did say that they weren't going to go through the whole dependency chain which kind of makes sense because that's yeah. immediately a lot of work right if you do would do that you would have to kind of force yourself to do the the simplest things first the, the underlying libraries and then build up until you reach some usable project uh, level and that yeah. will take way too much uh, time to get something actually usable one of the other things i think that you can indicates how skewed the data is based on the stats they're using to calculate the criticality score is the fact that the number 12 item is azure docs <laughs> documentation is critical you. if the documentation is wrong it's gonna have effects uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah that's the total number of commits that's uh, skewing that one very exactly. tightly exactly well it's it's also the contributor count like the yeah. the only it. other project in the top <laughs> 10 that has more contributors is definitely typed so it's it's and the commit frequency is absolutely insane uh compared to any of the other projects in the top like 60. Yeah. even so, i've committed to azure docs so ah uh, so that's where the vulnerabilities will be <laughs> <laughs> typos <laughs> typos cause problems <laughs> indeed indeed yeah. Well, anything but, else? Yeah. Anything else for you? Anything else worth kind of highlighting? Do you think on this? Yeah, I was kind of also thinking about the future of this thing. Let's assume that this works and they have the toolchain in place and it all works. Uh, they already kind of bounced it back towards their uh, the OpenSSF scorecards, uh, where you can have kind of an overview of uh, these these 
project have gone through what we recommend to do. So not the Alpha Omega project yet, but what the OSF already has in place. So that already exists. Uh, could you see a future where this becomes kind of a, a brand of quality? And if you want to roll out open whatever in a financial institution, it needs to have the OpenSSF Alpha Omega brand of approval or else we will not trust it. Because at the moment, and I'm thinking financial institutions because I've had that happen in the past, they are kind of responsible for vetting a lot of open source software and they have these ghost scans happening and there's thousands and thousands of thousands of things going out there, coming out there that need to be fixed, which may basically means <laughs> thanks but no thanks. Mm. This could become something really big in that point of view if the OpenSF is willing to position them at that point because it will need the OpenSF to become a kind of an accreditation uh, body which even though they have the scorecard and certification already in there it's not really the same thing but it's kind of getting there so that would be uh, it, that's how i for me i'm not a security practitioner myself but that's why for me this is an important thing to find out if that becomes something that i can use to make sure that okay this will work with whatever i'm doing on a security point of view yeah no i i mean i would love that to be a an outcome that this achieves actually i think that would be that would be beneficial and a, a really positive outcome from this i th i do think there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of time effort blood sweat and tears between now and that potential. true but there's no competition because nobody else out there on the commercial part will ever build something like this that will be used by other companies because why would they? So even though it takes a long time, if they get it done, they will become the de facto leader on it. Yeah. Uh, the one thing I want to close off with perhaps is that uh, I was kind of surprised to see that the three people that were doing the presentation, the webinar, well, one was from the OpenSSF himself, of course, but the other two people, one was from Microsoft and one was from Google. And what I just said about commercial entities will never do this. Well, apparently the big Google and Microsoft, they're big commercial entities, however you want to put it, they've already decided that they're not going to do it and put their weight behind the open mm. uh, initiative. Or is that too much subtext reading on my part? I, no, I think, I mean, both organizations are massive consumers of open source. It is in their interests to participate in the securing of the open source ecosystem and i i can see more organizations getting involved in this because they have a vested interest mm -hmm. if you like in yep. making sure that they're not you know part of the next big data breach that they could have avoided mm -hmm. now this won't answer all the problems and all the questions but i do think it's a step in the right direction for organizations like google microsoft and Hopefully, many others will, will get involved as well. Yeah, I mean, if nothing else, this will at least open some people's eyes of the importance of securing open source stuff. Yeah. So that's, yeah. Indeed. Well, in that case, I think that's all the time we have today. You can support this podcast by becoming a Patreon. Every contribution helps. We are on YouTube. You can like, you can subscribe, you can hit the notification bell, you can do all the YouTube things. Please go to www.roaringelephant.org for a link to our Patreon page and for more information about the podcast. You can also follow us on Twitter using the at Roaring Elephant tag and send your feedback, if you're that way inclined, to podcast at roaringelephant.org. Until next time, my name is Open and Secure Dave. And my name is Rip All Those Embedded Bitcoin Miners, Jon. <laughs> we look forward to talking to you next week. Goodbye. See you then.